Hello there. In the name of Jesus, how you doing? My name is Garabo. Cranberry K. Kurazi, Kurazoshes, Kari, Gari. If you want to be all heard and get all about it. Um, Cranberry K. Mm -hmm. You can also call it out in song. Anything works. What is important, however, to gauge from out of all of that is that I'm the daughter of the living king, the living god. His name is Jesus. And I adore him like a fat kid loves cake. So having put that out there, I've got some stuff to get off my chest. I've come out of a relatively horrific weekend. It's been kind of deep, all right, uh, in the sense that I was attacked quite a bit by spiritual war. And I'm like, <laughs> I've been at this for a minute, which is, get it. I don't capitulate. I don't falter. I don't fall. I don't flatten. I don't make like a steamrolled thing on the floor and just like not rise again. All right. Um, those of you who did what you did to me, you know what you did to me. And I'm not going to like labor very much on what you're all about. But I will say this, I did get quite a few nightmares. One particular person, a friend on Facebook, former friend, a guy, I, I dreamt about him putting a gargoyle. You know what a gargoyle is? Like, gargoyle. It's a gargoyle. Uh, these funny little menacing creatures. I should have closed the window back there to extract some glare. Uh, maybe I'll do it still. You don't see my nether regions there, are you? Anyway, y'all know, this Oki. Gargoyle, let me come on, you know like those funny little statues, sometimes they're chilling as a water feature outside of a house or something. And they're like, ah, and then out is like water coming out and they're just like monstrous and menacing looking. It's a gargoyle. I dreamt about this guy putting a gargoyle on my like doorstep just outside here. And I'm like, what are Now a gargoyle is some kind of a, like a caricature built by the hands of men to depict some demon. Right? They're demons, basically. And I dreamt about that dude putting a gargoyle outside of my house. Well, in this little establishment, it's my humble, very exceptionally humble abode. And it's a joke. It's laughable. Why is it laughable? Because this is what God was basically showing me by showing me this guy's witchcraft using a gargoyle. That is a thing made with stone, just chilling there outside of my door. What can I do? If I woke up in the morning, I was like, oh, I'm awake. And I walked outside, neither regions can't show, and I walked outside, okay? Uh, and I was like, oh, there's a gargoyle on the floor. I just looked at it and you know what I would, you know what I would likely think it represents? I would think because my mother is very artistic, she likes ornaments, like funny little things that she would buy. You walk in the house one day and there's like a thing there and it's like, oh, she bought a thing. I would likely think my mom just bought an ornament at like the builder's warehouse and was like, oh, I think it would look really great just next to Garabo's shack. Yeah. I would like literally write it off as something that my mom thought would be nicely decorative or ornamental in the yard and so she just kind of blonked it right there. Walk right past it like it ain't jack, you know what I mean? Yeah, that's what I would do with a gargoyle. So basically what the Lord, like just chilling outside, I would think it's a feature, an ornament. Uh, the Lord was basically showing me with that, hore, that. All of your sorcery, whatever you can throw at me, it's laughable, it's something that I just kind of like, you know, like a fly around my nose. And I'm just like, oh, ugh. and then it like eventually like disappears. If it's irritating enough, I might just grab some doom and be like, and then I'll just like hear it buzzing on the floor, breathing its last following which I'll pick it up with a tissue and flush it, then wash my hands. That's what your witchcraft is. I have been endured through so much spiritual attack for years that I literally just like, when it's all up in my grill. Like when witchcraft is all up in my grill and I know that that's what's going on, I just feel agitated and annoyed like for all of five seconds. I then swat the stuff and tomorrow I'm like today. So I walk right by it. I like literally just glide by it. You don't endure a person through so much hardship and then expect them to faint when you rock up a brand spanking new idea as to how to bewitch the crap out of them. I don't fall from witchcraft. I just seasonally get agitated, maybe sneeze a bit, and then come out on the other side of right. And then get told, Garabo, how do you dare sneeze without putting your hand? I mean, come on, where are the germs? You've got no manners. And I'd be like, well, I mean, like, who has manners when they're being attacked by witches? Who, who? Guys, stop. You're filthy. You're dingy. And you're living dangerous because, frankly, you're going to go to hell for it. But if you don't want to stop, all you will have done is put an ornament outside of my house that cannot speak, that cannot see, that cannot gesture or mobilize, and yet you have made it a god. It is your idol, not mine. When I see it, it's like an ornament just outside my house. It's menacing, but it's only there because somebody in the house has a different taste from me when it comes to furniture and garden ornaments, and I'm not going to argue with them because it's their house. So you put a gargoyle on, like, a, a, a porch, a doorstep, on somebody else's property. If it was my own poor property, I would just ward it off, you know what I mean? But I can't, uh, since I'm living here, you know, with other people that are into the darkness. So stuff just kind of lingers and hovers around for a minute, and the only people it affects are those people in the house that don't know Jesus. As for me... It's just a little bit of a fly around my nose that I just swat. And then I come back the next day looking all fabulous. And I'm like, oh, I know what you did last summer. But anyway, whatever, moving on. Christ gives forgiveness. How about you go to him already? Guys, stop. Your little ornaments, the gargoyle da luna, your sorceries, your ancestral worship. Your trips to Maria to go and worship some like fake god that ain't the king. 
Do you? But understand that you're going to hell after. You're going to hell after, and I'm going to heaven. Now that we've gotten that out of the way, just in case you're feeling a little bit inspired to do more witchcraft, understand I'm going to swat that witchcraft too. Nothing of your darkness works on me. This here is called apologetics, and I got it down. I've been dealing with this for years. Don't nobody bewitch me successfully. So, it makes all the sense under heaven why no one has been checking out my recent content. Hey, Batung, gargoyle place are just outside my, outside my house. My stats are going to pick up again. And when I say pick up, I'm speaking 5, 10 views, whatever. When I upload something on YouTube and there's like no one looking at me, mm, I need those 5, 10 people to look at me. You know why? Because the kingdom of heaven rejoices when even one sinner repents. So if five meager individuals are looking at me, I'm like, that's five souls for the kingdom. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not motivated by numbers, guys. I am not, but I am absolutely disquieted when there's zero views on even one of my videos. That, that is gargoyle activity, and I'm gonna spray doom on it, following which is gonna make like a basketball and bounce. Don't say I didn't warn you, I'm that girl, I clap back at demons, and then they like don't come back, they shut up again. They tremble in the presence of Emmanuel. They are not happy in the presence of Christians, they itch. They get a breakout into hives or something. They get all, you know, agitated and they start to get queasy and nauseous and are like, What do you want with us? That's the power I have in Christ. So send me more gargoyles and watch me only trip on it because you put a funny little thing outside my house and then get up and dust myself off. Though the righteous man may fall splash on the ground. Seven times. He gets up each time, but the wicked, I think that speaks about most of you, yeah, okay? They're suddenly overcome by calamity, so watch me, you random gargoyle bring a bomb my doorstep. Just strive through your random rubbish. No wonder I was feeling like crap the past few days. I'm back now. You yeah, know I'm back. I'm back. You yeah, know it. Uh, I'm back. I'm back. That slumpy mood that I was in just day before yesterday. Aww. It's gone. And I'm back. Bring me a gargoyle again, I'll slump for two days, and then I'll be back again! You know it! Uh. Come at me! With your devils! Or repent, man! Because your stuff doesn't work. Moving on. The topic of today, actually, is a different issue altogether. I want to talk about men, 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 Ooh, oh. I'm a child of God, I've been going through a minute for a minute. It's been a situation, now I'm saying. And it's been kind of rough, now I'm saying also. Mm. I don't know how to deal, now I'm saying again and again. And this situation that I am in has taught me some pretty awesome gems. I have gained wisdom in the past eight years that I found myself in this situation. What's going on over here? I think I'm gonna burp. Uh. Yeah, that's how I feel about this situation, all right? We just burp it, and then somebody's like, girl, you're so rude for such a pretty chick, and I'm like, well, guess what? You're rude also, because you're a witch, a witch, you know what? Uh. I'd rather be a girl that burps every so often, even though I'm cute. Then to be a witch, a witch, you know what? Anyway, listen up, listen up. I've been going through stuff for a minute. I'm fly, I'm gorgeous. Please, like, don't nobody deny it. I know you want to deny it, but, like, where do you live? Do you have eyes? Can you see? If so, then why are you acting like you're blind? You're blind. Dim Klevna. And Ubu Klevam, let me speak in English because I'm not interested in a South African audience. I just keep on, like, bouncing back into that state. Like, it needs to stop. I'm leaving this country. Alrighty. My beauty has been around for pretty much since I was in grade 9, so I've been killing it for a minute, okay? I'm 37 now, it has gone nowhere. It's still like chilling outside my doorstep, just like that gargoyle you sent me, random. Uh huh. It's not leaving me, meaning that I'm still the kind of girl that makes guys feel a little bit, you know, antsy, shaky in their knees, gua blah blah. Yeah, things like those. Alrighty. Now, being a girl like that can get you dating some guys. Thank God I got born again in 2011. Patung, married women, I am sorry if your husband's turned out a little bit awry inside the marriage because you didn't choose Christ before you got married. I'm sorry that you're no longer taking photos with your husband that you used to take many photos with on Facebook back in the day when you were still dating because they've just gone awry on you inside a marriage. I apologize. I apologize. But many of y'all like did try and give the gospel even prior to you getting married and if at all you had embraced Christ, God would have done what it did for you in my life. He would have done what he did in my life for you. Get you out of a nasty relationship where you're going to end up married to a dude you can't freaking stand anymore. Alright? I'm sorry that didn't happen, but this is your judgment. Because not only are you now making me suffer because you married that random that was not okay for you in the first place, but you're also wreaking havoc in my life because I haven't aged a day or something and I'm still... I'm not buying your skeleton anymore. I do apologize those of you who are not from this country and I keep on belting out into my natural language. I am having a difficult time overcoming old habits. They're dying hard. Okay. I will continue to remind myself to speak English. Listen. 
I dated horrendously. The thing about being a beautiful woman is that you get wanted by guys who think they're in your league. They think they're in your league, these guys, so they come and they ask you out. Beautiful women, contrary to popular belief, don't get pursued as much as average Janes and Joes. Bear with me, this is not an arrogant woman talking, this is a seasoned with a whole bunch of persecution women, so you might want to sit me out before you write me off as narcissistic or whatever, or conceited, I don't know, do you, but stop and stay around. Here, sister, talk for a little minute. I've been going through it eight years in the fire. Eight, eight, almost a decade. Don't nobody ignore a person that's been burning for eight years. Come on now, don't do it, okay? Just chill. Listen, wait here until I get to the point. Beautiful women do not get asked out as much as people would love to believe. If at all they're models, if at all they're celebrities, if they're in the entertainment industry, then maybe, perhaps, maybe they might just get like millions of people looking at them just because they're cute. They might get pretty privileged. If at all they're influencers on social media, they might get freebies at restaurants and stuff. But if you are a regular underground, below the radar type beautiful woman working a regular job, nine to five in corporate, or just some chick going to university, and you're not so much on social media, or you are not recognized as a celebrity or a superhero star or whatever, y'all know your life is hard, okay? It's a little bit hard. It's not quite that of Beyonce's, not everybody's trying to poke at you, prod at you, not everybody's trying to be with you, not everybody's trying to like buy you free things. So pretty privilege is pretty much a myth, okay? It is a myth. It is a complete myth. Pretty women that are not in the limelight, that are not Beyonce, in other words, that are not Rihanna, that have not been elevated to world prominence due to how beautiful they outwardly are, are somewhat greatly harassed. Harassed, yes, harassed. It could be harassed, but who here is the master of pronunciation? Stop me, stop me, stop me, dare! Okay, uh, y'all know, their lives are rough. Their lives are rough. Their lives are seriously tough. And the stronger ones cognitively, mentally, those that can actually make better decisions for, them, so for themselves, independent of society, tend to stay single well into their 40s. It's unfortunate, okay? Well into maybe even their 50s. Why? Because they've had to break up with a myriad of random buffoons out in these streets that turn out later on to be ravenous thieves of their general glory. Yeah, and talking you know, stuff like that again breaking out into my language. Listen Gorgeous women beautiful women that are below the radar are afflicted women and if if They are cognitively strong if they're very smart if they know Their story they tend to get passed up not passed up. No, they tend to Not marry because they dump a lot They dump a lot like they break up with men a million times they just don't end up married because it's like, you know, I can't know. Hmm. What am I gonna do here exactly? With who's this guy exactly? I'm sorry, but like, uh, drat. That's what happens especially in the black community it's really quite the epidemic reaching pandemic proportions reaching even endemic proportions the way it's just so part and parcel of daily life in society listen up if at all you are a below the radar kind of bleeping on it pretty chick you will not have pretty privilege what is pretty privilege Oh, what is with all these urban dictionary definitions I have to keep giving to these like random audiences that are trying to pretend I'm not edifying? Okay, pretty privilege is basically getting stuff did for you because you had chick like what? Hey, you look to the right, people be like, hey, right. you look to the left, people be like, hey, okay, that's actually the right, the left, the other left, people be like, hey, ooh la la. And so because people be like, ooh la la, when you walk into the room, they then just give you like free hors d'oeuvres. They then just give you like free schwaff snapses. They then give you like free lobster. They give you free like caffeinated drinks. They give you free like pizza, you know, free maybe even shoes if you walk into Christian Louboutin or Gucci. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty privileged. It's what it is that causes these... Uh, uh, TikTok dancers that have got two left feet, frankly, that can't really move, uh, to get these like prolific views and then next thing they be getting free Nike sneakers or whatever. Or they copy content of not so pleasing to the eye people and then their channel proliferates this stuff. There was actually like a whole march riot on TikTok not so long ago where the black community was basically boycotting uh, TikTok and said, we're not gonna dance anymore because all these like white girls and all this racism around the world, they're taking our dances and they think they find themselves in a Jimmy Fallon show. I'm not doing it anymore, man. I'm not doing it. Yeah, I was like, you go on right ahead and strike on TikTok and watch your own stats dwindle. As for me, I'm gonna keep on dancing until Madison stops. Like, is that basic? Like, these white chicks that are flawless, like gorgeous, beautiful, like blue eyes and these like tendrils in their hair with this great blonde skin, this great blonde hair, right? They then rock up and like steal a dance from like some. Like, young little teenage girl that's yet to grow into her boobs or something in the black community but that's killing it and knows how to dance and then she copies the dance and then brings her white skin forward and then next thing she's got like 10 million views. 
and that is apparently the dance that she pioneered right that's what's going on unfortunately the world right now still kind of got like a eurocentricism disease where they they look firstly to very bright skin and so if you watch more so do people gawk at you and that caused like a whole riot on twitter where black twitter not twitter sorry black, black tiktok was like never again am i gonna be copied dancers off uh, type establishment uh, thing and so basically what it is that those those really gorgeous white girls were benefiting from was pretty privilege like they were so pretty that everybody liked watching them dance in the exact same way that the black girl that's yet to grow into her boobs was dancing with some obscure background uh and lighting conditions kind of shoddy mommy and daddy are not happy to buy them a ring light or give them studio lighting there's no funding of their like what's going on with me right now like you've got really great content but i mean look at the background it's so dark where's all the light you rock up and you say excellent things but you don't get hurt i mean a white girl that's got like a rich dad that's gonna buy them studio conditions then rocks up and those blue eyes of hers pop or ever more uh and then they get followed uh no the black community i seriously don't think it has anything to do with white skin i think it has everything to do with the fact that a lot of times you do record in the obscurity of your background because there are many a uh, tiktok phenomena on um social media that are black that are getting seen because they have gotten those studio conditions don't make everything about race black people just don't do it like it's not that deep i promise you anyway whatever so that whole situation right is pretty privileged when you get clicked on purely because you're cute like your content could be dry everything about you could be lackluster you frankly you could be a wall absent in terms of any kind of quality or je ne sais quoi but you're cute though hey like subscribe comment and then share Okay, and then you continue to get propagated and propagated and you bubble and you bubble and you make like, you know, all effervescent dripping out of the cup and bubbling and it'd be like, oh yeah, I like this girl. Oh, hey. That's pretty privilege. You get pretty privileged when you finally do get noticed by complete strangers. People on the outside, on social media, and they're like, boom, I want to like this guy. And I'm going to make this chiquita a million subscribers or a million followers on the Instagram machine. That's pretty privileged. When you get looked at purely because you're pretty, whether or not you've got any real talent. Okay? Now, that's for these people that indeed do go on social media and be like, look at me, oh, look, I'm so beautiful. Eh, I can't smile, and on top of that, I can't twerk it. And so because I'm twerking, look at me, click on me. And then proliferate me, and they say I'll be going making endorsement deals when Nike gonna buy me sneaker and give me a hundred thousand just to do a video. Tell me, please, that I'm beautiful. Rock up using the, the beauty that your mama and gave you, and you just like plaster it on social media. And then you get pretty privileged. But if you don't go on social media, and you are kind of conservative, reserved, you know, like Quan K back in the day before she got lamb basted, but some of y'all. Okay? Like, you're just working at 9 to 5, you're cool, you're a project manager, everything is good in the hood. I don't got no problems, I don't want to be a celebrity, I'm not trying to be a celebrity. I just want to be a regular mom, you know, pushing a pram in the mall, adoring my cute kid, loving my husband. That's what I want to do. Let me be in the background. Let me be there, please. And then you threw me into obscurity, and then I had to go and innovate a way where pretty privilege will start to apply for me, you know what I mean? I never had pretty privilege. Pretty privilege only applies to social media sensations. Pretty privilege only applies to women that are in the limelight. They get promulgated because they're fly. But if you want to be a regular Jane and a regular Joe, you're going to struggle to get loved as a beautiful woman. Which can explain why some of these pretty privilege having girls on TikTok are committing suicide. It is because their natural lives, their real lives, the lives that they wake up in the morning with halitosis entering into are so harsh to them that they cannot stomach their daily lives even though they've got these millions of people that like them, that share their work and that subscribe. So a woman with pretty privilege only has it on the internet. Everywhere else, she's treated like the scum of the earth by never mind females, but also men she is not truly loved and as a woman you cannot just date a fan you cannot just date a person at like a like a, a thousand miles away type of distance you can't just accommodate any random person that likes your stuff that is happy to um pump you up with confidence because they keep on congratulating you for beautiful things you're doing strangers are happy to say hello you're great but it is those that are closest to you that wreak havoc in your life so a man that comes very closely into your environment can actually talk to you, that you actually humor, that you actually respond to, that you truly, with everything in your body, are happy to accommodate as a husband, a fiance, whatever. Somebody that's going to be the dude, you know what I mean? The chosen one, the, the, the lucky guy that makes it into the life of the woman with the pretty privilege. Those are the ones that treat these women really horrifically. These people that are actually in the lives of the woman blessed with beauty become the curse. You know how they say beauty is both a curse and a blessing. Uh, so friends are, the real friends, the ones that are actually in your life, uh, not the 
Facebook friends that you met on Facebook, not the followers on Instagram that followed you and so you followed them back but you've never met them. I'm speaking about the people that you wake up like and walk next door and see them. The ones that are in your actual life that have smelled your halitosis in the morning and seen you without makeup. Those are the ones that treat you most like you're the scum of the earth. And since we tend to desire love from our immediate environment, there is an emptiness, a canyon, a gaping hole that is ever yawning at everybody, at us, when we get so much affection on, on the internet, online, and yet not so much in your private life. You would much rather be loved and pampered and cushed up by the man right next to you that is your husband, rather than a whole bunch of men that are happy to send you flowers with nothing in return. Men that are happy to send you gifts to your post box because you just like danced so well on TikTok. You would much rather have uh, your own brother next to you right here Acknowledge that you're beautiful today rather than some dude that thinks you're the baddest chick in the game because the most important um, Response to our persons as human beings come from the people in our very immediate environment and unfortunately they're very scathing So we're finding these young beautiful like flagrant TikTok stars committing suicide and you would wonder why is a woman a little girl like 17 18 year old 19 why in the world did she commit suicide when she's got like 2 million followers on on Instagram? Why? It's because the world is just wretched and rancid and the Lord has seasoned me in the understanding of that. And so I am now therefore never ever going to find myself ever again in a relationship with a gangster man, with a random, a buffoon, a nitwit, a no-brainer, never again. You know why? Because now I know how to allow a man into my life, what it means and what it takes. When you are a beautiful woman, you get pursued by men only that properly believe they're in your league. Everybody else just kind of avoids you. Every other man is too scared to come at you. Every other man is afraid to holler at you. Every other guy imagines you're just going to like turn them back or whatever. And so it is only those ravenously pompous airhead buffoon men that tend to ask us out. A little bit of a Danny Bravo. Imagine that guy hollering at his sister. What do you have other than brawn, dude? What do you have other than muscles? Like a dude that is so handsome, that is so desired by all the women in the office or all the women on campus or all the women in the classroom if you're in high school. A dude that is so desired that when he wants you, he automatically anticipates that you're going to feel blessed by his pursuit of you. It's menacing frankly to have to deal with that kind of insanity okay it's really quite menacing these guys rock up and they ask you out with an anticipation that you will likely be happy to accommodate them and the sad and sorrowful thing about them as well is that they tend to have come from histories where they lacked the clout that they now presently carry they are boys and uh, men basically that were boys that were disregarded at some point and then they either got money or grew into their scrawny little boy figure and became these like buff athletic men that are tall and as tiring as they are above women are so therefore very attractive and then if at all that that physical attractiveness of this also comes with money they then forget literally disregard unrecoil forget who they used to be at first that is the problem that I'm dealing with right now. So women would know this. Girls would know that this is true. You know how men, um, boys, when you're in high school, they're just so funny looking. It's like, oh, Jomo, oh, goodness. He's busy sending me love letters in class. And it's like, he's so gross. Have you seen his knees? They're so skinny. They like literally pop out his pants, eh? The other day he washed towards that soccer practice. And I was like, are those legs or sticks or what? And he's literally trying to highlight a sister. I don't do high school boys, please. Like, whatever. My boyfriend uh, studies at vets. Like, please, like, you and your knock knees. Oh, please, like, what? You're going to scrape me. Anyway, they are nasty in high school. They're, like, negligible. Just, eh, duh. When you look at them, you just, like, uh, you want to drool. It's just so horrific to look at them. Nothing to write home about. Like, I was wholly unattracted to the boys in my school. There was one, however, uh, that I kind of knew. I'm not going to give the proximity of how close he was to me because then it's going to make it obvious who this guy was. But there was just one, like, tall, lanky, skinny, funny, looked like he had those sharp knees that could pierce through his school pants. The way he was so skinny. And he had this gargantuan head I couldn't get. Like, where does it come from? Like, how do you walk around with that without just, like, tipping? tipping over <laughs> ah, but he was he was nice you know he was friendly he was friendly he was good people you know like what you know hey chest bump 
scum bench, like just really good, like great guy, like friend zone material, if you know what I mean. Uh, but yeah, date him what? No. Oh, he looked like you know those things that you blow wind into them, and that you find at the carnival or whatever, and they just like do this. He was that lanky. He looked that weird. Like who dates that, right? Uh, that was him all the way up until matric, the last year of high school. That would be grade twelve. Oh, yes, like it, guys. Like somebody give me a fan. Oh, it's getting hot in here. Hey, I can deal. That was me. <laughs> With this same guy on the 10 year anniversary of our reunion, like our high school reunion, I was like, somebody found me because I'm getting a fever in the morning. I could not believe how fly he became. He was so fly. He was so good. You know, this guy was just like, I can't believe it. Is that you? Is that you? No. He got so handsome. So handsome. He gained some weight. You could tell now he was working out. He grew into that body and he was already tall, like quite lanky. So he looked like, imagine a ball player. Guys, he was just, I was like, I can't believe that this is the same guy. He had this big head, remember? And on that head, he also had these typical big black lips. They all of a sudden just worked out and they look like these kissable things. I was like, I can't believe I'm hot and bothered by this random fool that I just was like, yeah. Hello, guy. I'm trying to cut him. Thank you. Mama, you put this to mama. Like that, dude? Became high. How are you? Like, how's the laugh pen? <laughs> like, you know when you like can't even hold your horses in front of a dude, it's like he can tell that you're getting all hot and bothered. And he's like, really, really? Can I, well, that's you, you, you? Are, you're like, flirting with me? Hey, am I looking in the right direction? <laughs> this guy just got so beautiful. Guys do that. They, they pull a fast one on women like that. They do that. In high school, they're these lanky, funny looking, weird guys with scrawny little skinny knees. And then they get some fat on their bodies. And then some of them, they go to the gym. And then you see them after 10 years, maybe even five, perhaps three. You don't even have to go that far. Some of them blossom in varsity as early as that. And then, and then you start to feel like, you know, if I had dated this guy in high school, I would have been a high school sweetheart and now I'd be facing getting married to him. Look at him looking more like Danny Bravo now. But that's just the thing. They end up like Danny Bravo. Braun and nothing but. This dude was very sweet. So sweet that you would even tell him, oh, will you see mama? In other words, greet your mom when you get home. That same Oki that was so sweet that, you know, you would walk with him to the taxis and then hug him and be like, thanks for walking me to the taxis. And like, he's crushing on you heavy and you're just like, dude, you walk me to the taxis. I'm grateful that you're being chivalrous, but <laughs> my boyfriend is from vets, okay? <laughs> But hey, say hi to your mom. <laughs> Passing him that kind of shade in high school. And then he just like, becomes this like freaking like alpha male with like pheromones for days oozing off his general personality. It's like, ha, huh? yeah. It's raining on men. Hallelujah. <laughs> it was a killing of these guys. <laughs> they just grow so fly. After high school, I have learned my lesson. Men I am. Don't be underestimating scrawny little boys in school uniform. They become men. <laughs> anyway, so that was this guy right and he represents quite a large like number of men they, they do that like even Mufs Maponyane the celebrity in this country has a similar story he said that when he was in I mean he's like hot like if you go on uh, the internet and just google Mufs Maponyane like yeah he will kind of like you know hold your pinch your nose here and be like you know I don't know I can't deal or I'd like to flee somebody somebody give me a little bit of a cooling agent I don't know Coca-Cola I don't know Somebody give me juice, man. Like, I need to cool down. When you look at his pigs, like, you will feel so ridiculous that you're so far away and he's not even talking to you. Doesn't know you. You're just a fan. All you can do is follow him on Instagram. Like, that's it. He's so far. Like, you feel like he's the man of your dreams, but he's there. There in the dish, far, far away. But apparently that dude, if you had met him in high school once upon a time and you gave him a lot of day, he would have been your boyfriend. And maybe your husband later on if things worked out. Hey, Latung. He would have totally looked at you like just three, four, five, ten years ago. But now, you're far away on Instagram. He was clicking on his stuff and liking and sharing and like, ah! Well, apparently he was a scrawny little funny kid when he was growing up. And the girls in his school were just like, hi, Maps. How are you? Say hi to your daddy since he's a soccer star. Bye. And then he became Mouse Maponyan. Everybody knows who he is. Like, don't nobody move. Apparently, he was that scrawny dude. And now he's not anymore. So, Mouse is a, a celebrity example of somebody like that, right? Well, I have met non celebrity examples of guys like that in my life who in school were just like a uh, drat. And then next thing they became, what is going on out here in these streets, right? 
unfortunately however now i can't speak for marcy's a celebrity he's there far away so i don't know him personally but unfortunately what happens with these guys also is that remember he's the guy that you like say hi to your mom he's so kind he's so sweet he walks you to the taxis um he's just like, like a really cool, cool guy when then they gay they get into their bodies women are not blind so they notice him you know they they notice his buffness they notice he's a really good looking guy and if he does well in his career too he's also got money blah blah uh unfortunately that chivalry that they had when they were kids that kindness that sweetness that they had when they were kids that ability to just relate with them and hang with them and them have your back and just really regard you as a person like basically just the manners that their mom has done taught them to go to they become pompous they get arrogant but these are sought after men they're sought after so basically the decorum that dwells in a man the virtue that dwells in a man that makes him treat a woman well it gets chiseled away at and i'm uh, not chiseled away i sorry yeah well, it gets eroded away at with the acquisition of handsomeness if at all they grow into bodies that once never used to suit them um and also if they alongside it gain prosperity financial prosperity if they you know get that apartment get that house get those shoes shining every day once they get there they they lose the ability to adore a woman um maybe i, I don't know what it is it's like a, an exchange and it's a very horrific one it's like an hourglass exchange where sand is literally flowing from one place to another it is not um like sand that is getting filled in one place now that they've grown in this area they are maintaining their character it's like character gets drained when they gain the opulence of external glory alongside financial um strength and uh it, it appears to be something that you can't conquer as a woman you cannot get both and i am learning that the ridiculously hard way right i have learned that the ridiculously hard way now, this Maps Maponyane type phenomenon, we shall call it a Maps Maponyane phenomenon, is the bane of the existence of beautiful women. It is the bane of the existence of beautiful girls because a girl, whether she's average or beautiful or not so attractive, still wants one thing in this world, love. Christ said to men that you must love your wives as I have loved the church. You must love your wives as Christ has loved the church. That's what Paul wrote, right, in the, the epistles. And so that basically highlights and makes it clear that women need to be loved. That is the... The thing that they need the most in this world more than even money the world has been deceived into believing that money will make everything corrected uh because these women who marry for money find themselves very miserable in marriages later on the primary thing that a woman needs is money but men uh, not money sorry love uh, but men need to be able to know how to do both for crying out loud like they proper it is men's job according to god to provide for their families to take care of communities to take care of women and children to have their back to be chivalrous uh but it is also their job to love women so basically we need a full package we need a guy that is able to buy us a house a car and take care of the babies in our stomachs and then come home and buy us flowers wine dine us and treat us like gems that is what a woman needs it, it, it appears out of reach out of sight out of mind therefore like it is unobtainable and so women have settled for money um who Man, I cannot imagine what it would be like to be in an empty house that is exceptionally gorgeous with a guy that just does not freaking get it at all. Like, when he used to get it. That's just the sad thing. It's not like this Oki has never been taught some like manners. He had them once, but he just imagines that he doesn't need them anymore because he's got money. They become so cold and so hollow, just empty, you know, barren. Like, you speak into his heart and there's like an echo. It's like, where is, let's say, you know, the maps, the, let's just use Maps Maponyani as an example since we used him. Where's Maps? Like, where's the Masejo? That's like, you know, his real name. His, um birth name where's my sejo like what the heck is this like what's happening i'm not saying much is like that i'm just using him as an example please like i'm not lost putting the guy in blast yet don't know his character don't know how he is as a person i don't know him personally right so i'm just using him because he once gave an interview where he made it clear that once upon a time he was a scrawny kid in school that nobody liked and they he got to varsity and everybody was like hi mops right so i'm just using him as an example um type establishment thing yeah no uh the, the character kind of flees with them they historically were not able to ask women girls out that were a particular way they were scared of them they had guababa they were shaking their knees the the gorgeous girls that they fancied also were very friend zony of them they could not for the life of them get these women even though perhaps maybe they might have crushed on them they might have had some kind of feelings for them and it's like this is exactly what creates a bitterness in them it's like once they notice that they're getting noticed by the kinds of girls that in high school were friend zoning the living daylights out of him he then starts to it's almost like it's like revenge even though there's no need to be vengeful dude you just got hot like things happen in life those women were not mean to you they just were not quite trying to date you women want manly men and boys in high school are not manly so if they don't want you it's not because they hated you it's because they wanted men it is inbuilt in us to have that desire for a strong outward outwardly strong man 
and also a man that is able to provide and protect you kids in high school are taken care of by their parents and on top of that they are scrawny i mean boys we grow into our bodies in high school they grow into theirs after high school like it's just, that's the way life is and so when then they're not attracted to you in school it's not because they're trying to come at you or make you insecure it's because you have not yet made it into the kind of manhood that women tend to be very attracted to so when you grow older just be thankful that you finally caught up and now are desired perhaps maybe the lord keeps you guys so scrawny because you know you can't provide for women so what are you doing dating them like you shouldn't be dating in high school you shouldn't like if you can't get married yet don't do it because it's gonna lead to fornication and that's what's gonna anchor the lord not only like anger the lord but create these soul ties and all these other complications that come on later in life so perhaps maybe high school boys are kept looking kind of obscure by god's grace so that they can be ignored until they're able is to give them strength because men struggle with lust is to give them grace to not date to not fall in love violently and so sin against god the lord makes it such that you only start to become kind of like you know pleasing to the eye when you have money it makes sense because then you're ready to get married <laughs> but now you get offended they get offended they get super duper offended um and that offense then causes them to become these like incredible monsters later on they become these gargantuan ravenous fools later on in life and they hurt women like no man's business like dude it was not my intention to break your heart you were just kind of skinny in school <sighs> why are you hating me now what i do to you other than notice that you're skinny hey they will make an enemy out of you hey! when you were chest bumping and fist bumping in high school they lose their character they lose their virtue forget what their mama's done taught them forget even what their daddy's done taught them because their daddy's done learned some lessons you know what i mean after hurting women they forget all that and they become brand spanking new repeaters of the generational curses of their moms and dads so mom tells them don't do this because I did it and it hurt me something bad dad says the same thing but they're like no I'll take my chances and then they end up like what their moms and dads repeating the cycle of advice to kids that will never listen those things are only broken when you come to Jesus Christ is that basic okay so these men grow they notice that women notice them now and it's the kind of women that they always wished would look at them back but never did and so now they start to desire the kinds of women and want only them that they could not get in school However, they come in there with so much attitude, like, you're never going to treat me like trash again like you did in school, or at least a ten amount of you back in school. You're going to listen to me now. And you are going to appreciate who I am and basically worship the ground that I walk on. And because women want to be loved, first of all, if a guy's like super handsome and he's asking you out, you're like, oh my goodness, I really hope he's going to be my really great boyfriend or whatever. And then when he isn't, because you're really falling in love, women have this thing that they do where they want to panel beat men, chisel them and fix them. Uh, even though he's got these character flaws that are frankly unacceptable, she's like, no, I can change him. And so because of that, they sit out very passive aggressive boyfriends that are just unloving, but they outwardly look so great. And man, how they love to take these photos on Instagram, these photos on, on Facebook and everywhere else showing these uh, gorgeous boyfriends of theirs and they look so good but my goodness behind closed doors he's just such a horrific man so basically very beautiful women that hoped Uguti, their beauty they hoped that their beauty would basically land them a prince charming end up married to some of the most menacing men under heaven um and this is because these menacing men come from a history of being disregarded grew into manhood and so because got wanted and then they started to elevate their standards in terms of what kind of women they want and when then they land a really gorgeous one they load it over her with an iron fist um that is basically what it is that was the curse of adam in the garden when he fell with eve the lord said that now that you've fallen you're going to want to load it over your wife with an iron fist and so that's what happens with these guys instead of being loving and cherishing of these females they become iron fist um monstrosities that just want to rule and run their world the response of smarter women um however that don't just capitulate to this tyrant in the house is to just keep on dumping them and so you find then therefore the smarter among the really gorgeous women ending up single all the way into their 40s etc it's because they keep breaking up with these guys because their character flaws are just so astronomical that they're unavoidable like it's not something that you can just settle for you can't just take it you can't just take it like when a guy is rude when he speaks to you disregards that you're actually beautiful is passive aggressive does not praise you is ever like saying random stuff like are you really gonna wear that when you worked real hard to put that outfit together when a guy has no care for the fact that a woman's beauty as it fades over the years apparently allegedly according to society standards make her invaluable uh, uh, invaluable anymore and he just like adds insult into those injuries then there are women that are smart enough to be like i want to be loved i want to be married i don't want to end up alone but my goodness no that that i'm not gonna take i'm one of them i'm one of those smart women 
that dated a guy that all of a sudden became super rude because he made money and he started to become ridiculous and I was like no this here is not what I'm about little D no we're not doing that they get dumped but then guy was like 37 38 single <laughs> Even though I was supposed to be the kind of girl that got married gloriously with like, you know, chariots of fire and everything at my wedding. Some of the most epic women are single uh, because of this. If they're smart, if, they, if they're happy to rather settle for singlehood than just being dealt a bad blow by a, by a rubbish, nonsensical, absolutely rude husband. Who tends to display these rudenesses before he even becomes a husband. Because God is gracious to throw warning signs to you, women, to let you know that if this is only going to get worse from here. Like, it's an exponential decline, to understand? If you've already plateaued in your relationship, and the plateau is not an acceptable standard by uh, that you can settle for in marriage perpetually, if you are unhappy with where the plateau is at because this guy is just generally very mean to you, honey, it's only going to get worse. You're going to be ending up with a little bit of an Ike Turner for a husband who's going to loathe you, resent you, especially considering you keep on growing strong materially. This is a guy that has not been pruned, a guy that has not been given virtue. This is a guy that has not had... Um, the, the, sins of, the sins of Adam uprooted out of him. This is a guy that has not been given Christ that he might do a better thing with a woman. This is a guy that is not given understanding by the Lord that, look, you were scrawny and skinny in high school. That's why women didn't want you. It's not that. They were deliberately trying to make out of you a monster. So don't make like Zach Stacy and make your girlfriend eat a television, please. Now that you're a ball player. Now that you're a basketball player. Like, seriously, do not... Abuse women because you felt ignored by them as a child. You were a child. What were you going to do for a woman then anyway? You were not going to be able to marry her. You were not going to be able to take care of her. Your mama was still giving you an allowance that wasn't even enough for you to go see the movies. So what do you want with a girlfriend anyway? That glorious, that gorgeous. You're going to fall violently in love with her and you're not going to be able to marry her. And later on in life, she's going to find another man. And you're going to be upset and go bewitch the living daylights out of her. So I make you obscure so no one will fall in love with you at a time when you're in no position to give them the love and the cherishing that they need as women since I've called men to go and love their wives as Jesus Christ has loved the church. Unless a man gets trained stuff like that because he turns his life over to Jesus Christ, he's going to be a prolific horror story walking around to women. And that is what it is that I have observed over these years that I've been persecuted. I realized, I noticed, I gauged upon, I gazed upon, I, I picked up that the reason the Lord put me in the squalor and this obscurity for as long as he has was that I might learn how to allow a man to choose me. How I will allow a man to come in and ask for my hand in marriage. What ought be the hygiene factors, the primary existing forces inside his heart that are the fortress of character? What is the basic minimum in order for me to let him court me? I had to be weaned off the challenges that women that are beautiful face in the market out there in the wild jungle out there when they're literally like asking for husbands hoping that somebody's going to get down on their knees and propose i was with the mindset of a typical beautiful girl i in and of myself was like there's only certain guys that i'm going to be with and they have to look a particular way. I frankly love to get my body dressed up. So I don't want my man wearing bad shoes. I don't want my man not knowing how to put an outfit together. I don't want a man that doesn't know how to ma like match his belt with his like, shoes. I don't want a man that doesn't know what a fitted suit is. I don't want a man that does not appreciate a good cologne and aftershave. I don't want a man that has got nails that grow beyond a certain length. I don't want men, a man that does not know to hold a wallet. I don't want a man that does not know to basically shave his hair i don't like hair on men i find it menacing i don't know what's up with these german cuts all over the show i don't want a man that's too girly he has to be a little bit rough around the edges but he needs to know how to clothe his body because i look good i don't want to be next to a guy that's just crafty wearing some sticky sneak and like some whoops of a jean type thing that's the kind of way that i am still frankly and i was very much like and so what it is that caused me to consider a guy coming into my life was firstly what do you look like on the outside Right? I'm also quite tall. I'm 1.75 meters tall, so I don't want a guy that's shorter than me anymore. I used to date short guys. I realized, can't do that. I don't want to be falling pregnant and getting all fat and then me looking older than my man. And the way to look still younger than my man and still womanly in comparison to him is if he's tall and kind of, you know, buff. Like, I'm a big woman. I'm a tall woman. I'm slender, but I'm tall. And so I need my man to be tall. So if I fall pregnant, I'm not going to look like my, my, my man's mom. <laughs> I don't want to look like his mother. I want to look like his wife, even though I've put on a few because, you know, pregnancy type thing. 
those are the kinds of things that I looked for. I started to look for even when I came to Jesus. I was like, my man has to be tall, taller than me, and he has to be a little bit thick, you know, not buff, like not daily bravo, like you can't even put your hands down next to your um, thingy the way that you just so work out, but you just need to have a little bit of girth to you. I don't want skinny, scrawny men. I used to date them skinny, but not anymore, right? I just want a man that very typically looks like a man, like a man, you know, da, what, right? First and foremost, and he needs to know how to put his outfit. Those are the things that I took to God, and I was like, this is what I want a man. I don't want a man with dreadlocks, with hair. I want to be sharing the mirror with him. I want a guy that's ever twisting his hair, busy all up in this like grill. I just shave it off. What's wrong with you? I can take a man, however, with a beard, like bring it. Like what? If it's manly, I want it. I, like that's what's going on. Like a beard, like facial hair. Rock up looking like Santa. I take it. <laughs> I love manlyhood. Manly, anything manly. I'm feeling it. I'm not a fan of chest hairs, but I'll take it as well because it's very manish. You know what I mean? But no. Don't bring me a dude with like shaven brows and like lines in his hair, gem and cut, like twisting dreadlocks, like flicking hair out of your hair like your carabo, messing with her weave. Mm -mm. I don't want anything in a man that's just gonna make him a little bit girly. Like don't. But a man needs to know how to put his outfit together. He also needs to be clean. He needs to know how to take care of his environment, blah, 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 all that jazz. So those are like my physical things. And I used to, as a daughter of the living God even, like beginning of my faith and all, uh, look at men that way like literally try to get married by a guy that will initially just initially the first thing i look at how you be looking dude what shoes are you wearing mm -hmm. do you know how to wear jean do you know how to wear pants do you know how to put a nice shirt together do you know how to iron it not iron you don't have to know how to iron although it's ideal that you should not wear creased shirts so if you can't iron get an ironing lady or whatever but um do you know how to put it on your body with the right belt and the right... Do you know... Like, I, I, I appreciate a man that can put an outfit on. He doesn't have to be always in smart casual. It can be like jeans and sneakers, but he just needs to know how to do it. I, I love men who can dress. I really do. It's been a thing since I was a kid. I'm personally into fashion, right? But I don't want men with hair. Like, don't come here with your dreadlocks. Like, what? Hey, Andy Le Mube. Everybody knows that that dude shaved his hair. And then all of a sudden it was like, I've been feeling concerned. Funny way late later. Trying to hold back these feelings for so long. And if you feel like I feel, baby, come on. Ooh, come on. Ooh, let's get it on. Like when you see that guy rock up, the song comes in the background. He just did a 180. Like he was undoing the like whatever. This guy already threads. So I, ugh, you know, these dudes and they flicking up hair out of their faces. And then the dude shaved his hair and it was like, quing, quing, quing. And you suddenly understood how such a gorgeous woman like Ayanda Tabitha would end up to, like marrying him. Anyway, whatever. And he has his issues and frankly he just needs to like clean them up. But the guy got suddenly handsome because he cut off his dreads. I, I don't know why men don't spot that. Like the same thing happened as well with Stromland and Dandala. Dude was all up in this dread vibe and it was like, oh, what's that? And then like, oh, whatever. And the next thing he shaved his hair and again it was like, kum, kum, kum. I've been feeling that. You know, he got hot like overnight because he cut his dreads. I don't know why men grow hair because they just look so much better without it. Do the math. I don't know. Do the math. Do the math. A small little amount of hair on the head. Cool. Mara, don't come here with these gym and cut this in Gaga and then dress like this. Hey, <laughs> man, I'm sorry. I can't deal. Just a small amount. Just a tiny. I can deal with that. But don't rock up with this, like, ravenous me. Like, Trevor Noah, I, I dig that dude, right? <laughs> I had a crush on him back in the day. But I really don't like the hair he's got now. I'm like, Trevor, it wasn't broken. Why are you fixing it? I don't like men with hair. I don't like hair on men because when he's like, this is too much work, too much. The two of us cannot be like fighting over the mirror, like elbowing each other out of the way. Like a dude needs to be in and out of the house in the morning. Like there just needs to be less time invested in a man's getting ready than a woman's. I just feel that way about me, you know what I'm saying? Anyway. Also, a guy who can be too much, it's like, eh. Anyway, whatever. I want my men manly. Super manly. So he had to have short hair, if at all, no hair at all. Ideally, if at all there's any hair on it, it's a tiny little amount that he touches up every so often at the salon and that's it. Um, at the barber shop, uh, I don't mind lots of facial hair, like whether he's cleanly shaven off or some facial hair, that's cool. Like, whatever. Like, if it's manly, like I said, I can even take a Santa beard on a man. Like, I'm taking it. <laughs> if it's manly, I'm running with it. Um, but do not, do not, do not for the life of me be a little bit of a girly man. Don't be neater than me as a guy. Just like, what are you doing? It's my turf. So based on that shallow way of looking at life, that's how I chose my men. I chose my boyfriends based on how they looked outwardly first. So when I was at varsity, uh, in this one course that I did management, 
we studied something called hygiene factors and satisfiers. So quickly, I know I've been speaking for like ever in a day, but I'm gonna get to a point, right? All right. The hygiene factors are basically things that you need, and without them, it's unacceptable entirely. Satisfiers are things that are like going the extra mile over and above us, and if they're absent, you're not gonna miss them. So in a setting like a hotel, for instance, if you walk in there and there is no toilet paper. That's like toilet things like toilet paper, hygiene factors, clean bed sheets, hygiene factors. Um, satisfiers, however, if you're on honeymoon and then at the hotel they make a decision to put candles in the bathroom that have got engravings of your names, calling Miss Mr. and Mrs. Newlywed. And you're like, oh, I'm so, so sweet. And they put like rose petals on the bed. Like, oh, I'm so, so sweet. The hotel went another way because they knew that this is our honeymoon suite type thing. Those are satisfiers. If the married couple walked in, Pencad, I'm not here to be bossed by you, okay? All right? Yeah. Okay. The married couple uh, would not have missed them. Like if, if they walked in and they um, and that wound of yours appears to just like not be going anywhere. It's just, I'm just so frustrated by so many things. Anyway, whatever. Uh, the married couple would not miss the rose petals or the candles in the bathroom, blah, 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 if they were not there. They would just walk into this, like, you know, uh, honeymoon suite at the hotel and be like, oh, okay, it's clean, it's nice, whatever, and carry on about their day. But they would feel really blessed if they went that extra mile. However, if you walk into this hotel room and there is no toilet paper and you open the bitch linen and there's, like, menstrual periods there, they're dirty, or, like, somebody's fingernails, like, shavings. In the sheets you would sort of blow your top you would blow your top those are basic things that in the absence of them being like neatly like ducks in a row you would just lose your mind it, it would not be acceptable for you to just run with it those are hygiene factors satisfiers are extra mileless that in the absence of them being there you won't miss them hygiene factors are imperatives that in the absence of them being there you can't accept it you can't take it i unfortunately historically on the come up as a woman dating Focus first on satisfiers as opposed to hygiene factors. So in dating, right, in courtship, in relationships that lead to marriage, hygiene factors are things that you, for the life of you, ought not take um, as compromisable or we can negotiate here. And I never knew that that's what I needed to do before I came to Christ. And even in the beginning of my relationship with Jesus, I still was focused very much on satisfiers as opposed to hygiene factors. So I was still looking at the outward appearance of men, whether or not their shoes matched with their belt, stuff like that. They wear cologne, aftershave, blah, blah. Uh, and what that did was I only dated one guy, one guy since coming to Christ. It went awry very quickly within two months, right? Uh, but I've been single for the, like with two years into my faith, I dated one guy and then the rest of the time I've been single, okay? Uh, and I ran with satisfiers with this guy his outward appearance he wasn't even that tall but he was very handsome and he knew how to put an outfit together so i was willing to just kind of compromise on the height and whatnot but he was just mm, freaking ungodly like he was he claimed to be a christian that's why i even accommodated him but he started to just ooze these like character flaws and they irritated the living daylights out of me but this is not the guy that i'm going to be highlighting well who i'm going to be highlighting rather as my ex-boyfriend right before i even came to jesus christ as the perfect example of what i likely am supposed to do or was supposed to do even as a woman um in christ but the thing that corrects the awry shape that things went is the love of god his mercy his protection for his bride his protection of his daughters and his sons he is the one that makes sure that people don't change character over time so uh, but rather grow get sanctified improve increase right um Crank hat. I don't know when that wound of yours is going to heal, but frankly, I just feel as though my life is too tough. Okay. <clears throat> Alrighty, so... When it comes to men, right? First of all, I'm a beautiful woman and I'm still beautiful. Like, don't nobody trip about that, please. Alright? Uh, so I am aware that it is... I'm at a dangerous turf. We get treated horribly. I've presently got no friends. Nobody loves me. Men treat me like rubbish. Like, men treat beautiful women like trash. They just do, especially in the black community. Okay, we are supposed to have pretty privilege, but we don't because we're not superstars. We're not TikTokers. We're not Beyonce. We're just regular Janes on Joes on the street, underground, undetected, under a radar. So men slap us with just a copious amount of reverse psychology. They don't even pursue us that well. They don't pursue us lovingly. They don't make their agendas clear and known up front. They dilly dally around us for a minute, uh, play mind games, and just what are you doing? Okay, uh, and then they cause that they mess linger. Like there's this thing that men do, especially like yeah, they will pursue you, right? And they will like knock on your door, scratch even. Like you will hear their scratches like the way that you hear my cat scratching to try and come inside. And you'll be like, oh, whatever. When he's scratching. And this dude will keep scratching. You'll be like, hello, 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 Kahabo, hi. Let me tickle you, girl. Hey, I just want to say hi, hi. Hey. Ding, ding, ding. 
hi. Uh, what's up, Jim? Oh, hi, girl. Come on. Yeah, who are? starts to roar. Ah. And the next thing you'd be like, oh, goodness, this dude has been roaring for a minute. Hi, hi, hi. What do you want? What do you want? Like, yo, what do you want? Yuck, man. You've been knocking on my door. You're irritating. I can't even sleep. What do you want? And he's like, nah, I just wanted to say what's good. I think you're beautiful. Like, hey. And you're like... Mm -hmm, keep talking <laughs> and as soon as you open up like a flower as soon as you blossom as soon as you you accommodate him as soon as you start to hear what he has to say yeah man whatever happens to scratching like i would really like it if you continued to pursue me while you're pursuing me i would really love it if you were to continue to talk to me i would really love it if you continue to humor me and let me know that i'm wanted and desired by you i really was quite um flattered by how hard you worked to come in like you scratched around so much and you roared and you, your antenna was like all up in my grill you were spraying pheromones into my environment and i was like oh okay you're a hard worker in pursuing me so maybe you'll be a hard worker in loving me and then you start to open your heart and you start wanting to reciprocate you start wanting to reciprocate because you, you like you don't catch feelings and then the dude next thing is like calling you after five days the dude is like responding to your whatsapp after three hours and then next thing the dude is like not liking your new pic on Instagram even though you've accommodated him as a follower even though once upon a time you wanted to block him and it's like I'm sorry dude like you scratched at my door like a freaking animal why in the world are you, <laughs> why are you passing me shade now that I'm trying to say I love you too <laughs> I'm sugar. dude what are you doing and it's just it becomes so hard it becomes so difficult then if this thing is going to end up being a relationship you date him and he just declines from there it's like but in the days when we went together, you probably think being that Beyonce song that Disney's child at first we started out real cool, taking me places I ain't never been. But now you're not responding to my WhatsApp and you're taking 10 hours to respond to my emails. And on top of that, you don't want to watch my car. You traveling, good for nothing, type of brother. <laughs> but by then you're in love, and it's like, come on, I don't want to just get out of this. I love you. Don't not scratch anymore. Like, work. Bounce around like a kangaroo like you used to do. Let me see you bounce. Make like a rabbit. Bounce. And then the dude is just like, cadaver. Like, life is just like still, like flatlining. And I'm like, and then it becomes like that. It plateaus on that level. Whew, for three years, four years, five years in the relationship that you're with him. And all you have are these distant memories. Desert-like conditions. Tumbleweed rolling in them. And all you see is a mirage in the distance of how he used to scratch at your door and bounce on the floor like a kangaroo at some point men do that and i have experienced so much of that in my life that i'm just not going to experience it as a christian the first man i ever loved did that to me i was so fed up and so upset with with his antics after he won me like he literally stole me from his friend okay he stole me from his yes i did that i did that to a brother somebody somebody hold me down somebody whipped me okay like i deserve to be chastised i heard a guy <laughs> i left him for his friend <laughs> <laughs> I was still a virgin so I didn't sleep with both guys therefore don't come here don't come at me like I'm some kind of a hoochie mama but yeah okay this dude pursued me that way and was happy to break a like friendship with a friend just to get to me and that bouncing up and down on the spot that he did I was like he's really gonna love me and then once he had me hmm, I was singing him that song with Jennifer Aniston tell me when I'm coming you're gonna love me <laughs> and I was like no I am too young and I am too fabulous to be scratching around after a guy so my mom moved out of home and i didn't tell him but i already wrote about that like back in the day when people had landline phones don't nobody have a cell phone so you couldn't follow me around uh and so that's how i dumped him i basically left him because i was like you don't you don't get to disregard me like me <laughs> you get to disregard all this and he lost me he lost me that way that's how he lost me uh but later on in the future i sat around a dude like that dudes like main like i think i would go so far as to say every boyfriend i've ever had has done that to me like they have pursued me very relentlessly, kind of like a bug a pest frankly get off my you know swat them like a mosquito draining your blood um and then once you like let come let them come into your inner circle um the guy then just starts to chill yo relax you're all like ah ah sure where's your energy boots Where's your juice? Where is your acha and your pepperoni? <laughs> Why aren't you hot anymore? I'm proud. I don't like this mild antique of yours. Come here with Nando's Peri Peri. Don't come here with mild. Give me extra hot. Where is it? <laughs> God. And you sit that out for three, four, five, six years. And now imagine sitting it out for life. Because you said, in sickness and in health, till death to us. What? I had acha me. Next thing I'm telling you about just plain mango. What am I supposed to do? There's no heat. 
No spice, no fervency of love, no effervescence, no E, no, no Corenza C, just Dololo, flat Coca Cola, eh, eh, boots. Funtano lamna, eh, eh, come on, it's just a time drop, boots. And then those boots is like, um, from the pimp, and then nagging, yeah. I'm sorry, I don't want to be hell health, no fury like a woman scorned. I'm not trying to be a diary of a mad black woman. I'm not trying to cause a guy to nearly drown in a bathtub, eating bubble bath like bubbles because I'm upset that he left me for a younger woman. I am not trying to deal with the typicality of a man going right on us later on in a situation that you just can't escape, okay? No. Uh, so this ex-boyfriend of mine, I know this is lingering for long, but I'm sick and tired of trying to please people by keeping my blogs short um, because... No one's watching me anyway, so you either are here or you're not here. I'm just gonna share my work. Uh, yeah, so here in last the situation, I'm not gonna sing today because I'm rapping the way that I am, okay? Uh, here, so here it is that this dude, uh, they, they, they rock up and then they change on you midway. Not even midway, like very early in the relationship. They don't even take time, guys. You know, they call it a honeymoon phase. It doesn't even last honeymoon type, like months. It just, like with my last relationship, it lasted like, like two months ah, out of a five year relationship. I never got back that, you know? Initial stage, like I said, mirage, desert, tumbleweed, seeing it in a distance, looking all ethereal, and that's all you have, a memory. Hey, Batong. Like, it was just so terror. So terror. That's like half a word for terrible. Um, it was ridiculous, like in the worst way, uh, for me to have to handle or deal with that situation. And I only, came, I only found out when I came to Jesus Christ that hygiene factors were what it is that I was lacking. And that's why I got so duped by men, right? When I, with like my, my lost relationship, I... I was okay, I was content with the outward appearance, right, uh, with the way that he looked, but throughout the, for the better part of the relationship, he was focusy on me, he was uh, loving, uh, there were many other issues that we had, but I'm not even going to get into that right now, because I'm not even talking about that relationship, but I'm just talking on a very basic level of respect, like, an acknowledgement, like, wanting to be with me, wanting to, share. like, I had that, but my ex was poor, he was dead poor, like, he was, he didn't have money, he didn't have a car when we met, he couldn't even drive, I taught him how to drive, like, I, he was just a dude that I basically built. I made him. I made him what he became. He became a man. He was also skinny, scrawny, yeah. And then he got like he grew fat. I, I fed him, so his body filled out, and he became this like glorious, gorgeous man. And he also was now this glorious, gorgeous man that was balling, rolling, and he started a business and everything. And as soon as, as soon as he started to make some money, if I tell you, it's like he never knew who I was. I wasn't mean to him. I didn't reject him because he didn't have anything. If anything, the woman that he wanted to be with before he met me, he rejected him because he was just working in a call center, all right? I never heard him that way. I never rejected him because he was the scrawny guy in high school. It wasn't high school that I met him, but he was like the scrawny guy that like women just didn't want. But I, I took him. I took him because I was uh, flattered by the way that he pursued me. I was really flattered. Like he tried me for months and I didn't want him. I remember there was a time when I didn't have a phone. Uh, it had gotten lost or whatever and so he couldn't get a hold of me and we had a cell phone and he told my cousin I'll, I'll buy her a phone just so I can talk with her and I, I was like I was so flattered by that I, I just my heart was just I was like ain't nobody ever wanted to do that for me like the guys that I dated are just were just a wag so for me it was like okay this dude really wants to work hard for me let me give him a chance and lo and behold I gave him a shot and he was the first guy that I ever dated that did romantic antics for me like buying flowers and chocolates and like getting them delivered to me at my offices like stuff like that I've never I'd never experienced it before in a relationship so I was like I'm so glad I gave this guy a chance like, I'm so glad I gave this guy a chance because I never would have known what it's like to be romantically pursued and loved in a relationship uh, but it lasted like I said two two and a half three months <sighs> the respect right the pursuit of me um the romance the romantic streak sort of kind of lasted throughout the relationship and also he never ever grew bored of me which is another thing that i struggled with in my old relationships i felt like my boyfriends wanted to be with me for like as long as it would take for them to get what they wanted out of me and then i would need to get on a taxi and go home even if there like it was a solid relationship and this time around i could hang with them i could talk with them we could be silent with each other for hours on end and there would not be awkwardness or anything like that in the room that was the first really solid relationship of the nation that i was in so i was i was content with that and he respected me and he stopped respecting me and cherishing and loving me as soon as he made money like remember that i would loss money again it was this like sand draining out of from one part into another the outward loss started to happen and he lost character when he gained acquisitions and now he also started like uh, my ex well in terms of the way that he used to put his clothes on ish there was a season when he was just like so struggling financially that oh my goodness like i would look at what he's wearing and i'd be like i better love him whatever right but then he started making money and his wardrobe changed and i remember one time he came to my apartment and i was like look at you now look at you now look at you now 
year old in Peyton. Like he looks so good. He smells so good. And you know what? What did I do with this man in the relationship? Remember I said that all the time when I would look at his outfit and be like, <laughs> well, I bought him his first ever wallet because I wanted a man that had a wallet. Uh, on our first date, he was carrying cash in his pockets and like he would just whip out his bank card out of his pocket. I was like, what kind of a man doesn't have a wallet? I couldn't believe it. Like I was just like, what am I dating here? But he was so romantic and he was so loving that I was like, okay, I will wait for his birthday. Okay, don't offend him by just buying him a wallet, wait for his birthday. And then when his birthday comes, you will buy him a nice wallet and a cologne to hint to him that I want my man to have a cologne. I want my man to have a timepiece. Okay, so the next birthday, I bought him a watch so that he doesn't he didn't feel like I was trying to change his wardrobe. And I think he caught it. He picked up that you're standing next to me. You got to look a certain way. So he later on when he started to make his own money, he put some pretty good clothes on his body, had a great timepiece. He was into cologne, aftershave, all that. I basically fashioned him to be the man that I wanted. It took years. <laughs> it took years. <laughs> it took some time, but in that time, I was being loved, and I didn't care. He was growing, and that's all that mattered to me. I, I prospered to get him uh, off these funny little Mandariana shirts that he used to wear, to him knowing how to wear a nice crisp shirt, you know, that, that works well with some cufflinks. Like, I got my man looking like my man. Like my man. Not some the panzola boyfriend of some scotani <laughs> so we ain't don't know but Krabos, man i am a career professional look at me and i need a man to look like me so in the beginning of our relationship i used to get undermined a lot by people for being with him like oh, what are you doing with this guy I look funny yo but by the time we broke up he was fit and proper for me but he had our last lost some sand in character and that made me step that made me step that was not enough to teach me lessons, eh? I remember just sitting around being like, never again am I gonna panel beat a man. Never again am I gonna project manage a man. Never again am I gonna fix a man and make him wear a timepiece when never before he knew what a watch was. Never again am I gonna put cologne on a man. If I don't find him already wearing cologne, already timepiece wearing, already wearing the right shoes, already, he just does not get me. I was so upset with the fact that I panel beat my ex and made him a man that other women desire and then he became a monster, right? That I declared on the rooftops when I came to Christ that I will never again be with a guy that I gotta make into who I want him to be. I'm never gonna chisel him again, never am I gonna file him up again, never am I gonna get him to chop those nasty scotas cotani fingernails. Never. If he doesn't come right, I'm by when I'm busy for a ninja Never. I was so upset, I was scorned. And so in the beginning of my faith, I desired men that were already made. And I met one that I dated that I dumped in two months, but I also met a few others that I was kind of eyeballing and hoping that they would reciprocate appropriately. It ended in just flirting. Everything of mine just fell apart so fast that I nobody ever, like I never got to actively, you know, just actually be tried in the dating realm. What a, what a fish paste. That was the story of my sad and uncomfortable life, okay? These men um, that I was looking at had it done. There was one guy that I met, in fact, just prior, just a little bit prior to me coming to Christ. He had it all together in one fit. Everything. Career, the way he used to dress, the way he used to carry himself, the way he used to speak. I was like, he's perfect. And indeed, he thought that I was in his league. So he pursued me, um, found out that he had a girlfriend as well, blah, 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 all that jazz, whatever. So he was trying to side piece the living daylights out of me. It didn't really work out for him because I was not about that life. Um, but this dude, everything about him appeared just to be in place, in place. He, uh, I passed him shade when I came to Christ because I was like, you're not gonna, like, play around with me like that, okay? Because, uh, like, I know that you have a girlfriend. I see your Facebook life there with her. You're not gonna play me. You're not gonna get me to be content with being side piece material. Like, no, I'm not gonna do that. You're gonna have to leave your ex. I wanted him to leave his ex. And so when I came to Christ, I remember even praying about him once. I'm God, please make him leave his ex. Then his ex is girlfriend. Please make him leave his girlfriend and come with me because, like, I really like him. And he's just, he's so perfect. Everything of his, like, his career, he's cleanly shaven. He's, he's this, he's handsome, he's taller than me. He's, oh God, like, everything, he knows how to put a nice outfit together, but, like, I was basically asking God to give me this dude whose satisfiers was just gawking at me. His satisfiers were gawking at me, but all of his hygiene factors were lackluster. He, I had a conversation with him once about Jesus. I was interrogating the things of God at this time, and he was obviously and overtly very, 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 very antichrist. He could not stand Christianity. But I was like, but God, you can change him. You can change him. He could not stand Christ at all. At all. Like, he hated Christianity. Like, because of his trauma in the past of what happened. Not, not an excuse. Not an excuse that he could not stand Christ. I thought I could change him. But his, his satisfies were great. His outward appearance was great. And his career was great. Everything was good. And I was like, God, give me the hygiene factors. Build him into a man that I can be with. Please. Because outwardly, I like it where he look eh? I like it. I like it when me like it when he walk away. I like it when we come and go me. I like everything. Oh, Jesus, please give me your man. I want him. And Christ was like, 
this child like no Christ then was like he pretty much panel beat me into shape to realize that what I need to look after where men are concerned are hygiene factors and not satisfies so uh, that's why I made that blunder with the first guy I ever dated ever since coming to Christ two months lost it got him out of the way haven't been haven't dated ever since um, and all the guys that have pursued me in this time well not in the persecution <laughs> Because in the persecution, uh, nobody has been kind to me at all. Uh, but back when I was still employed, because I was employed for three years in my faith, and then I lost everything the last eight years, so I'm, I'm, I've been in Christ for 11 years. Uh, but back when I was employed, I got pursued by quite a few guys, and they all appeared to have their hygiene, they, they had the satisfiers um, on point, but they had all these stats that I just could not settle for. I couldn't handle, I couldn't take it. Um, they were, goodness, they were just like, nah. And on top of that, I was very, very fervent as a Christian, so doctrine. Doctrine. Uh, doctrine was, was, was just very big for me. So they, they were very heretical in what they believed. And I was just like, I just got heavied by them. And so I, when they pursued me, I was just turned off. I was starting to grow, basically. I was starting to grow in Christ. And I stopped taking into account just what they look like on the outside. But I still wanted a guy that was ready made. I still wanted a guy that was ready made. And I thought that God was just going to land him on that, sorry, on my doorstep. Literally all fervent and adoring of Jesus, doing mission work across the world alongside knowing how to put a good outfit on. And on top of that, he's tall, he's like, got, you know, his hair is clean. Oh, what? Yeah. I, and I, I've been underground, so I have not really been able to meet anybody in this time. But I was literally waiting for that. And I, like, I, for a very long amount of time, I was waiting for that to be the guy that suddenly becomes my husband. Until I went through so much rubbish at the hands of men that are already made. That I was like... I basically have to go through a volume 2.0 of what I did with my ex again when it comes to men it's literally the realization I am entering into now a volume 2.0 where this time around my my hygiene factors are solidified in Christ so that everything else will fall into place because that is scriptural the Bible says seek ye first the kingdom and its righteousness and everything else will be added to you right uh, in the scriptures it is also written that women are men's helpers suitable of the Proverbs 31 woman, it is written that her husband's confidence is in her and that he is praised at the city gates because of the go godly woman that he has by his side. Essentially, and also it's written in God's word that he who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. It is also written in God's word that a godly woman, a righteous woman is like a crown on the head of a man. She brings glory to him. So essentially, she gets married to a man and she goes straight to work to make him even better than what he was at first. She builds her into her insta husband, if you want to call it that. She makes him into the kind of man that's fit and proper to stand by her uh, later on in life as, as time progresses. She makes him fit and proper to be next to her. She builds him. One of the are like a balloon. She blows air into his balloon that it might become big and float in the sky. Uh, that is what a woman is supposed to do in a man's life. So the desire by women to meet a man that's ready made is actually unbiblical. Because men tend to come around a little bit rough around the edges, rugged and scruffy. And it is women that give them decorum, class and honor. Women are like a feather duster. They find a beautiful, shiny, like, gem in the ground. Or they get found by some beautiful trophy or whatever of a man. And what she must do is put some brasso on it, shine it, feather dust it every so often so it can continue to sparkle. When a great woman comes into the life of a man, he suddenly becomes this epic beast that no one imagined he could ever be. I did that with my ex to the point of making him a man that other women desired. And he passed me shade afterwards. What was the problem with my ex? He didn't know Christ. But I made him a man that other women desired. I could not stomach to be with him because he lost his character. So how do you circumvent against that? A man's hygiene factors have to be Christ. He has to be a soldier for the kingdom. He has to be a God servant. Men naturally come kind of rugged and messy looking. Like... Imagine, I'm trying to think of a dude that uh, just looks really great even when he's rugged and then he like cleans up really beautifully. Uh, in a movie that I'm, I'm trying to come up with like a, a dude of that nature. I think, is, could it be the Benjamin Button movie with Brad Pitt? But Brad, Brad Pitt is um, the typical example of, a, like if you look at Brad Pitt for instance in Mr. and Mrs. Smith, you know the part where him and Angelina Jolie are in some like a desert and they are looking for targets because they're both assassins and Brad Pitt is wearing these shorts and these boots looking just all scruffy and whack just really whack looking but you can tell that if you, this, this guy could clean up well something like that and then later on you see him in a suit and it's like wow that, that's what a man is like they tend to all rock up all scruffy with like cargo shorts and shoes that are torn and they don't know how to put their like 
outfits together everything is kind of alright like a child they're like babies and then they come home and their mother shaves their hair and their mother takes off um, their nasty clothes dunks them in a bathtub scrubby dubs dubs them puts them in some clean underwear and some clean clothes and they think the little boy looks good enough to go to church don't nobody want to mother a man and don't a woman have to mother a man if this man is godly he understands what he needs to do but there are certain things that men are just not gonna get right by themselves um, without the aiding of women if you look at, to find me any man that has gone from zero to hero that doesn't have some ex-girlfriend that put him there literally all of them have women that panel beat them into bitterness like these guys that suddenly mushroom into better men have transitioned through a woman that took them as they are and made them better men but they became monstrous and so these women left them on some i'm sorry you've become a, the man that i wanted you to be and now that you look this way you're crazy now you're basically out of your mind and as out of your mind as you are i can't be with you and so then she leaves him and then he goes out there and now all of a sudden all these women want him so what does he do he becomes a bitter little monster that is ever bewitching his ex-girlfriend because that's the one who got away because now he's in a jungle and he's dating all these random females that are fluffy that were not there from the very beginning they were not right or die but he realizes that it's that later on and so his whole character tanks type thing so since the only thing that makes sure that a man's character does not tank is um is christ when then you come together with the man that is in christ the risk of him going awry on you somewhere along the way down the road is eliminated because the lord makes a person a new creation and they grow from the moment of being a new creation from strength to strength they get sanctified they get chiseled they get made into better men and so because they get made into better men he's not then once he acquires his wealth and that's if he doesn't already have it but if once he starts to know how to put a good outfit together once he knows how to shave he's like you know wear some after shave some cologne once he knows how to put a timepiece on once he knows how to match his belt with his shoes because he's got this woman that groomed him basically he's not gonna go shallow Godliness is the hygiene factor, don't you see? Godliness is the hygiene factor that women should be looking for. A man should love Jesus. And so I have come to realize that just by looking at the way that men have treated me the past few years, that men that are already ready-made are kind of crazy. And this is likely because they have some other women that built them and they lost her. And now they're busy trying to find a woman that they think is in their league. If a man comes into your life and imagines that he's fit for you, he thinks he's in your league and that he's arrived, that he doesn't need to work, you're going to be a very miserable woman. So men who pursue beautiful women because they think that these women need them, he's going to turn nasty. He's going to turn real nasty. A man has to be scared to talk to you. A man has to have some kind of trepidation in him, consternation, anxiety. He got to have a little bit of a shaking in his pants. He has to maybe even pee slightly in his pants when you walk into the room. He has to be afraid to talk to you. There must just be an overwhelming box of amount of respect where he will even be, you know, he will second guess himself if he should like even like drop you an email today. He must just be sweaty palmed. Because a dude that rocks up on some now, dudes, I got, I got this, I got this, I got this, I got this. Shut he will have this for the rest of your marriage. You will be frustrated with how unloving he is and on top of that he will cheat. He's incomplete, he's uncertain about himself and so the way that he tries to compensate for that is by getting other women to validate him now that you're sick and tired of him so much that you don't spend much of your time just praising how excellent he is. A man that comes to you in consternation, you need not turn him back because he's scared to talk to you. And secondly, if he's godly, that is what needs to be the first thing that you look at. If upon looking at him, you can see Brad Pitt in Mr. and Mrs. Smith, they're in the wilderness. It's kind of scruffy. Look at him in those board shorts, looking all dusty. The ash of the sky, the ash of the land is on his cheeks. He's just like his hair. Like, there's so many mites in there. <laughs> he looks like he hasn't even like blown his nose today. <laughs> but if he is respectful and if he's God honoring and if he fulfills his mission from Christ to love women as Christ loved the church to be adoring of kids and women women in turn if he has a, a responsibility over society that is that way if a man walks in God's calling unmarried my goodness do not turn him back if at all you can accommodate like if he's like, of course there are certain things that you just can't take like I don't want a guy that's shorter than me right but if this dude is somebody that you can see then with a little bit of, you know, tweak here, tweak there, something can work. But he's godly. And he's also walking in a godly calling. In the sense that virtue, character, hygiene, 
factors are there he loves god and he's not in the business of abandoning women to die he's not in the business of allowing children to starve he basically is taking care as a leader in the community of women and children if a man is doing what god said he must do as a woman you need to Forget about your satisfiers for a season and think about your hygiene factors. If you do have feelings for him, of course, do not just date whoever. Just because he's godly. Like, everybody has a taste and a type and a preference. You, you shouldn't just, like, plunge yourself into a situation that you're not attracted to. But if you can see yourself chiseling a situation, if you can see yourself feather dusting a situation, if you can see yourself putting some brasso on some gem and then it'll shine one day, then do not disregard but also be very careful to gauge if at all he will be offended if you try to correct something about him or if you try like if you, if you, if you try to make a suggestion and he gets all like why are you trying to change me ah so you know i can't deal he needs to be happy to wear the cufflings you buy him on his birthday like my ex he needs to be happy to use the wallet that you bought him on his birthday and then he realizes that you're hinting that you don't get to keep your bank card and your cash in your pocket like some taxi driver <laughs> Dude, like where do you live? It's twenty, like well, like well, two thousand six. Back then it was two thousand and six. It was like two thousand and six. Like who does this? Hey, we've arrived. Okay, get a wallet, right? I mean, it was a big fat hint on his birthday when I got him a wallet. It was a gargantuan hint. Um, he knew that I was basically saying to him, "You are whack for carrying cash in your pocket." And he never complained. He never lamented. He never said, oh, so "You're trying to change me. There's nothing wrong with what I'm doing." He not only started using the wallet, but once that wallet got worn out, he bought himself a new one bought him cologne on the next birthday he not only finished that bottle but after that bottle got finished he bought himself a new bottle he let me train him he let me train him i just dropped hints all up in his grill and he just followed suit and so i got him to where i wanted him to get because he was teachable so if he's teachable in a way that you can gauge um like very early on then do not turn him back because he's kind of like lackluster in certain things. There are no rose petals on the bed. There are no candles in the bathroom. Those are satisfiers. You don't need them, but you can't do without hygiene factors. You cannot do without a godly man. He will only go awry on you later on. He will go awry in the worst way. So I am trying to implore or encourage women at present to not turn men back because they're not wearing a Rolex, because they're not wearing Ikikan Poboza Ishai Nayo, because they're not wearing the right belt, because they're not wearing a crisp shirt. Because they don't smell a certain way, they're not wearing the best cologne. Because their hair is not a particular way. Because they um, are kind of scruffy rough around the edges. And so far as he got you, he's protective, he's respectful, he's trepidatious and consternatious around you. He doesn't walk all up in your grill thinking he got this covered. He actually has some respect for what in the world that they have and you have to say. And he is full of pursuit and he never ever drops the ball in that pursuit. And he is godly. If he doesn't walk up with an arrogant lightning bolt thinking that Psh, you want me. Of course, why? Because I'm here. If he doesn't rock up with that, you can you can run with it. There was this woman at MTN that took a guy like that. Like from the, she met him in the office and she was kind of like, you know, put together. And when she started dating this guy, everybody was like, yo, set looking gaga. That means so much settling. Like there were whispers in the corridors, my ham hems about her coming together with this guy they got married within about six or seven months and as the years progressed i was at mtn for five years uh this couple i met them when i was just starting out as the years progressed yeah. <laughs> you know in the stairs in the community when people like start acting like this on some okay i will acknowledge i will like he got so handsome hey he lost some weight Stop going to the gym he looks so good he started putting an out like his outfits together like he started to look good like he was clumsy looking kind of you know shirt kind of there well, it's kind of creased today and then as the years progressed, he just was this handsome dude that was somebody's husband and you could see that he was a happy man. And I was like, impressive. You made him a man that you can be with and you patiently panel beat him into shape. I guess the reason she fell in love with him was because his hygiene factors were in place. He loved her, he cherished her, he married her within six months, he didn't waste her time. And by the time I left MTN, they were still married. I, I actually saw them at Clearwater Mall like a couple of weeks ago. Um, with like some kids so they've had kids ever since then right so they they, they 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 basically went from strength to strength and they're still together to this day and at the time when they started dating everybody was like and then she became the envy of all women because she got a man that loved her that married her that then became the kind of man that other women wanted to be with but now he was taken by her we have to learn the mistake I made with my ex was in being with a man that was ungodly. I'm not ever going to do that again. But now I know. Now I know what I need to do as a woman. I've been speaking for a minute now. It's been a while. But um, hopefully I have edified you in the season. I did want to get this off my chest so that 
um, the people who are busy currently breaking the living daylights out of me now can understand that I am very well aware that Christ put me in this position because the kinds of men that I was looking at once upon a time are so shallow that they never would look at me in this present state. You know how they come into women's lives because they think they're in their league. Well, I'm poor. I'm broken. I'm barren. Classism has slapped me. Dust is all over my cheeks. I've lost everything. And because of that, these shallow men think I ain't worth pursuit. I will therefore get pursued by a man who is godly and therefore knows what he has found. He who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. He will know that my godliness is a hygiene factor and everything else that I lack, like family, everything else that I lack, like friends, everything else that I lack, like um, even just trust of people, whatever has broken me over these years, himself, he too will understand. Those are satisfied that over time, if he loves me well as a man, I'll come, I'll overcome. I'll overcome my trust issues. I will overcome my uh, trauma. I will overcome everything that I am suffering with at present to do the way that I used to do and even the loss of family I will overcome all that in so far as he can love me well because all that matters is that I am godly he will fix everything else so I no longer am looking to be wed off to some dude with a perfect timepiece and a perfect belt with a perfect Instagram profile that where they keep on taking photos of random finger food I'm not looking for that guy because I am supposed to come together with a man and start that legacy so once we're together our Instagram page will look better. Our YouTube channel will look better. Our Facebook page will look better. Once the two of us will come together, I will be his helper suitable and all of a sudden he will get bolstered into great prosperity and all of a sudden my channel will also grow. Y'all need to understand, we're gonna be one of those it couples that everybody is going to be like, my goodness, when they came together, everybody was like, she ended up settling. <laughs> Until I made him the kind of man that every woman wants, but now he's with me and he's not going anywhere because he's godly. I'm gonna grow. And I'm going to have a beautiful marriage. And I'm going to be loved by a man that's going to help me conquer my trauma. And you will know that Christ did all this for me. All things work together for the good of them who love the Lord and are called according to his purposes. I'm signing out in Christ's name. I hope you've been edified, Cran K.